We're ready. Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time it is. You have joined in this time today for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. It's our poet's focus today on the theme of clocks, clocks. Ah, that can be mechanical or psychological. And we will be hearing today in our live open mic, the poetry of our 12 random, random sign uppers who arrived early to mesmerize us with their poetry on the theme of clocks. Well, I'm Sandy you know, and I'll be your host today. I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry and have been your host every Sunday since March 2020 here on our humble platform. We began going Facebook Live many, 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 many months ago but now we are here broadcasting from Zoom and sharing with you on our Facebook page, as well as our YouTube channel, all thanks to Don Krieger and thanks to Kim Ports Parsons for your uh, exhilarating and intriguing graphics that draw us in every week. We are... Uh, as I mentioned, we're a Facebook group that has over 3,000 members worldwide. And today we're going to get to hear from at least 12 of our readers uh, on the theme of clocks. Each, each of our featured readers will have five minutes. And if we have up to five minutes, I should say up to five minutes, we're talking about time after all, aren't we? Um, and if we have some extra time, we'll go to the wait list and pull in a few more poems on our theme today of clocks. Well, so let's get started. And I'm so looking forward and thank everybody. We have folks who are attending here on our featured list, literally from all over from all over the globe already today. So first up, our very good friend, so good to see you, Lori DeRosiers, hi. Hi, Sandy, hi everybody. It's so great to be here, I'm in Massachusetts. Um, so I have, uh, I put my link up there. My second book is called Sometimes I Hear the Clock Speak. So I, I have a lot of time poems, but I have the new book with me here today. It's uh, Keeping Planes in the Air uh, from Salmon. Sandy and I are Salmon poetry sisters, <laughs> siblings. So uh, I'm going to read you two, both from the new book. And <laughs> I just, oh, here it goes. I was on the wrong page. There we go. Elephant of Mortality. I hear another military jet whining overhead, and the only elephant in the room is the one, wooden one on the co coffee table, or it could be when I check on my mother every night, or listen for the next shoe to drop, or the clock in its blatant forward motion. Our mortality humming like feedback from a speaker marking the moment, which is all there is. So I watch the gray cat pull and push her breath, listen to my husband snoring as I type each night, when insomnia begs me to hold on to the last possible second of today, in case of a hiccup in the continuum, in case for someone I love, tomorrow never comes. Redemption. At midnight, I notice the stretch between time zones. Hawaii eats last night's supper while Ireland is waking to tomorrow. 
We live unaware of the curvature of earth, undaunted by atmospheric shift, unfazed by sunspots, tidal currents, meteors pass, satellites hum, we sleep unconcerned. We are a blip, someone once said, in the arc of history, and what we call history is only the human story. We look for evidence of ourselves in our world soil, but before that, we're millions of years without us. After us is forever time, beyond even the concept of time. Yet there are good things, legends we have invented, stories told, art wrought, songs sung for centuries, evidence of our best selves. Despite our future slumber in time's uncaring cradle, this is our hope for redemption. Thank you. Wonderful work. Thank you so much for starting us off today, Lori, on our poet's focus theme of clocks. Also, Lori's the editor of a couple really prominent, uh, significant, necessary, urgent, needed journals. Feel free to uh, post about them in the chat for our uh, for folks here who may not know uh, what all what else that you do in addition to sharing your fabulous poetry. Well, next, I'm happy to welcome Marsha Karp. Hello, thank you. Housekeeping. The keeping of this house has nothing to do with love. The window shades are drawn at dusk, rolled up again at dawn. The sheets are changed each Sunday night. Bread is baked each Sunday night. Sunday night, the lists are made, the money drawn on Monday. Each night, the bedroom door is shut against the prowling cat who's well-behaved except at dawn. The dishes from the day are washed each night. Friday morning, garbage goes paper, tins, and glass each second Friday morning. Mornings, half a tin and water. Evenings, water, half a tin of cat food. Wash the tin and put it in the thumbtacked sink side bag. Pay bills the Thursday just when due. When drawing money Monday, move savings money into checking. Items on the lists are checked when done and exed if not, then copied to a list of undone items. An item X for two weeks must get done or no penalty has yet been found, which gets an item done. All day Wednesday, think of love, feel unloved each day at dusk. Saturday, wonder where time's flown. Fly off the handle Tuesday on the bus. Brush the cat and take a bath Saturday or Wednesday. The rituals in this house have nothing to do with love. The toaster must be watched. The kitchen floor is swept each day. The windows washed each spring. Each spring others manage love. The rugs are vacuumed twice each month. The curtains washed by boiling. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Marsha Karp. Great to have you with us today. I'm looking forward to next time, of course. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Sylvia Clare, and I'm going to uh, also ask if folks feel comfortable, would you please share with us where you're joining us from as well? And a reminder, everyone, that you are listening to our live open mic today on the theme of 
clocks. Okay, well, I live on the Isle of Wight, which is a little island off the south coast of England. So the opposite end of the country from the Scottish people. <laughs> and it's quite cold here, but not frosty. We don't get snow very often. In fact, if snow arrives, it um, doesn't stay very long. We may get it for two days if we're lucky. So all you snowy people, we're kind of jealous. Anyway, um, I've got a poem here. Where have I got it? Uh, oh, here we go. I just lost it again. Where's it gone? Uh, called Solitude at 5 a.m. The clock tells me it is 5 a.m. I often rise too early for the day to begin, a kind of benevolent insomnia, allowing me a space to flow without plan or intention. I may read, write, meditate. Sometimes the ocean offers me a soundtrack, crashing waves, gulls wheeling high above, powerful forces changing the shape on the cliffs eroding and transporting in endless motion. In summer, I often venture barefoot outdoors to greet dawn's gentle hues and whispers, to converse with the insects and listen for the scratch of an early mouse out seeking breakfast. In autumn, I may return the wait the, sorry. In autumn, I may wait the return of the light, knowing it will bring the official start to my day. When I can bring mugs of hot tea back to bed for a chat, and a slow awakening with you, my love. In spring, it is the waiting for the early dawn chorus to arrive, a measure of time passing, new life, growth surging up through earth, as life and love surge through my weary but eager veins. In winter, it mellows, the sleep times extending. I know I will sleep, I know I will return to sleep before dawn arrives and awaken as if I never prowled the house in solitude, for those one or two hours of insomnia, most nights. Okay, my second poem's uh, a little bit more about time and life. So it's called A Time of Life. There comes a time in life when vanity really should be dismissed. Expectations, our backs are turned a point when we no longer need to impress with our bodies or faces, our experience should shine as much as our hair, what we may have left of it. There comes a time in life when love has become so comfortable, it just nettles, nestles into your heart. And there it stays, settled, a sanctuary, always present, no longer questioned, accepted by others. When love thus reclines, it truly has come to stay. There comes a time in life when death's proximity becomes tangible, the eternal sleep just waiting for us to sink into its long skinny arms that hold with tender embrace. That place, we cannot escape its presence, makes every moment more than precious. That's me done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sylvia, great to have you with us. And I know where we're heading to next, <laughs> but I will let the poet tell you uh, because our next poet uh, has been with us many, many, many weeks. And that is our dear Kate Wegerson. Hello, welcome. Know this. It's so wonderful to be here. And this is a story that is of my life and it comes with some ekphrastic picture. So I will show one picture and the title of my poem is The Clock, Meet Me Under the Clock at the Biltmore. Here is the clock. When you come to meet me under the clock at the Biltmore, wear your modest clothing. That would be a sign that it was the wife coming in to meet her husband. In my family, many stories have been told, but as I accumulate them, I am overwhelmed with the goodness that we all carry. F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda 
kicked out the jazz era when they got married April 1st, 1921 at the Plaza Hotel on Fifth Avenue and Zelda took a dip in the fountain and they went to the Biltmore. This clock ticks, ticks, 1920s. Oh, they were amazing. Scott, intimate, caring and frank. Zelda, poetic, full of metaphor. The sky over the lake closes like a gray oyster shell. Off they went, but we know that there was a wonderful skit, 1923 at the Waldorf Historia talking about meet me under the clock. 1950s, fast forward the clock ticks, ticks, ticks. Many men of my family worked in the city and as dinner and theater was planned, it was easier for the women to take the train from Long Island or Westchester County and wear your modest outfit to meet under the clock. Ticks, ticks, ticks. how we meet under the clock. Hmm, there we were. And now we're off to lunch. Lunch, where? Up on the mezzanine, it's the Squadron A Club. The Squadron A Club, wh what's going to be there? You'll see. There we were on the mezzanine, the Squadron A Club. An early divorce separated the 10 Claire men. Here I was sitting down with my wonderful uncle who taught me so much. And he was telling me that the Troop A of the Squadron A Club were the volunteer horse cavalry during the Spanish War. And we're gonna have lunch and there'll be some surprises for you. As I entered, they came one by one, my great uncles I'd never met. Oh dear. Beautiful, dear Kathy, you look so much like your mother, Mimi. At first, when you came in, we thought it was you. I am overwhelmed because then the clock ticked and ticked quicker in the 1980s. And suddenly, how was I, as I built a bridge connected to meet my first love. I ran away from him 10 years earlier. How was I there with him? How did we get into a cab to the Biltmore to spend the night? Oh, that's all how love lives. And then we run away again. But as we exited the Biltmore, that morning, the bellman said, a bag, ma'am? No, no bag. Oh, oh, so this was to define my character? I was courageous and brave. And the bellman said, ma'am, I'll put you in two separate cabs, but you need to know you're the last to leave the Biltmore. It will be demolished today, August 14th, 1981. As was demolished my perpetual error to allow someone to abuse me. I am free, yay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. The clock ticks, 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 and ticked and ticked <laughs> as we met under the clock at the Biltmore. Oh my gosh. Well, you're certainly meets the criteria of our focus today. It's our poet's focus on the theme of clocks. Where will that mercurial dial take us next? We go to Meg Carney to find out. Welcome.
Greetings from New Hampshire. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here again and um, participate in today's open mic. I've been enjoying the poem so far and looking forward to hearing the rest. I'm only going to be about uh, a minute and a half, so that I hope will leave some time for some people on the wait list. Um, I'm just going to read one poem from um, my book that came out earlier this year, All Morning the Crows. Um, and the book is, a, is the name of a, a bird, but the poems aren't really about birds, as you'll see. So this is going to be cuckoo, as in the clock. Um, it, this poem gave me a chance actually to use a word I've never used in a poem before, and that's viridian, you know, that like blue green color, um, which I, I love the name viridian, the, the word viridian, and it just, uh, the sound was perfect along with just the, the meaning. Um, and the woman in this poem is fictional, although I will say I was, I was thinking of my mom, uh, who was a widow for 20 years before she died in 2010. So, cuckoo on a golden anniversary. Each time the viridian bird emerges through the front door of the little house, the shutters fly open and all the couples inside twirl in their dirndled dresses, later hosen and alpine feathered hats first this way, then that. In her melodious kitchen, the widow still agrees each hour is a thing to celebrate. But tonight, when the shutters close and the yellow-billed bird backpedals just before the red door clicks shut, she stands there brandishing that old crook-handled cane, demanding to be told what the hell they're all doing in that house without her. Does she smell a trace of cigar, hear a bottle being passed around? It's not the first door slammed in her face, but it's the first one she'll smash. Though this chestnut stick was his and the clock, well, the clock, like her heart, is winding down. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Beautiful. Thank you, Meg. That's terrific. Like, just as each hour is a thing to celebrate, each poem is a thing to celebrate. Thank you for bringing your poem reminds me of also Meridian, the idea of meridians, which also have to do with time. Good, good, good rhyme there for folks if you're looking for a rhyme. Thanks again, Meg. All right, next we will hear as we tick tock away from Lynn Shapiro. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you all see me and hear me? Okay. Um, so I can't see myself, which is odd, but um, so I can't, I guess I can, I'm in that upper little corner. Um, I'm going to read two poems, two very different poems. The first poem is a very playful poem and it's an abecedarian poem. I don't usually work in any kinds of forms. And in true form, I didn't start with A. I started with G and I had a problem. So uh, it's called The Glass Hour and I'm gonna read the whole title to you. And of course it's in the middle of being, it's an hourglass that's in the middle of being turned. So at any point you start over. It's called As Beatific and Calm as the days of our fortunate lives. The glass hour. You drink this burning liquor like your life, 
that you drink like an eau de vie, and that's Guillaume Apollinaire. Intoxicating, the Jack in the Pulpit's resurrection, the Kaddish said daily, three times per, beginning on the day of dearth, the lantern case that protects flame from wind. My lateral line, my magnetic compass, align me with the poles, prepare me to cascade into the nearest whatever, all risks worth taking. Useless as a turtle till righted, I see time running out. Soon the quizzling grain will switch sides. The tally-ho of the triumphal crossing, the hour's destiny held in balance. Is this over here? Is that over there? But for a moment. No valentine to versatility. The sand veers in one direction down. In the end, a vestige of emptiness remains, spent as Vesuvius, victim of Earth's wandering. The sand siphons into the next room like the waste in the teeth of a tiger. The Zurich container yields to gravity, yo-yos to and fro like mercury. Blessed is the hand that can turn the world upside down in an hour back to our youth with zipless transparency. Oh, rise and fall. Okay, thank you. And the next poem is much shorter and a little bit more personal. It's called Track Signals. Lean in to see out as the train slows. Glass becomes framed mirror. Greenery becomes you. Flannel caresses your one-time youth. How liquid we are here and gone broken open by dappled green, engulfed by revered fusion of beauty and its opposite periphery and its opposite interiority and its opposite. The window of plenty induces emerald ecstasy. Pinholes of the past collide in the lush tracery, liquid jade hardens into something you can hold on to when the train rolls to a stop. If I lived here, would I be like Ivy? Warm light enfolds like a blanket in a greenhouse. From deep within the public address, missives blare to remind us there are schedules to keep. The track goes both ways and there's another you up ahead. Thank you. And I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynn. I, I, I really am enjoying the, just all the, the prismatic ways you all are looking at that theme of clock and, and to have to have the vision of the, the glass hour, the hourglass, fantastic, thank you. All right, we turn now to Josephine Lore. welcome so thank you. much. <laughs> I'm coming to you from the Rocky Mountain area of Canada. The city is Calgary. Its traditional name was Mokinsis and it was the the lands uh, inhabited and traversed by a number of indigenous peoples, the Pekani, the Siksika, Kainai, Nakoda, and Tsutsina. And I have two poems to share, and my cat wants to help me read them today. Um, the first one is simply called Time. Is this all you may ask when your time is up at last, when your time to live has passed and you leave the shell behind? Is that all? Is it time? Has it been enough? Is there ever time enough? Time for lazy sleep-ins and homemade hollandaise. Time to walk the dog and allow the cat to have its nap, 
curled up upon your lap. Time for playing cards and making roast and memories and love and poetry. Or do we just allow time to push us along one moment to the next? Do you hold your lover in your mind as sweet agony turns into even sweeter ecstasy? Do you let your lover linger in your arms, lay in the warm afterglow, follow the rhythm of breath to the watery timelessness of dream? Can you stay time, resist the lull and the pull and not drift off to sleep? Is there time enough for words, for gestures that know no words, for the things that must be said and the things you wish you'd left unsaid? Were we so wrong when we were young to think there would be time enough? The babe I held to my breast is now a man, and I see my own father barely able to stand, a machine in his chest, keeping time for his now failing heart. Is it true then that the whole of our lives, our time upon this earth, can be reduced to a single space upon a marble stone, the dash between the day of our birth and the day of our death. We cannot make time. We cannot stop time, rewrite time, recapture moments past or moments lost. I lay in your bed last night, listened as your body and your breath moved from ecstasy to dream. I resisted the lull and chose instead to hold you for one small eternity to hold on to that one sweet moment in time. And the second poem is called Bicycle Time and it was inspired by a photograph of my dad. Uh, it's a photograph that has yellowed over time and he would have been a young man um, in the 1950s. Um, he was living in Belgium before he em emigrated to Canada. Bicycle Time. Is it time you may ask? In my dream, my father slung one leg over the bicycle frame, turned to wave goodbye. And I knew I was not ready for him to die, not ready to hear the red dread snarl from the blackness outside the circle of light. When I was a child, my grandfather fashioned me a zigzag set of teeth from an orange peel. I grow old, I grow old, finalement je comprends. This might not be the life I want from my last days. I face my fate and yet, and yet, I will not do any yoga today. I will not write. I will not walk the talcum powder, soft sand of a California beach or eat a fresh picked peach or watch the orange ball sink into sky of red black. I will shower, eat my toast, try to silence the beast in its mangy coat with blood-stained yellowed teeth, who stands waiting outside the orange glow of light, of life, and beseech him to grant me more time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, um, the way that a poem can hold time it's extraordinary. It's quite the container. It's quite the container. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Well, I will let you all in on a little secret that um, the theme for today, although it is near and dear to my heart, was actually proposed by our next reader. So I'm very eager to hear what Kim Ports Parsons has to illuminate on this theme of clocks. Thank you, Kim. And thanks for the graphics of time. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Um, yeah, 
time, right? It just, it's an endlessly fascinating theme. I could stay in the imagery that I've been listening to for a long time, very happily. My poem is uh, sadder, harder, a little scarier. It's about wanting to turn back time to erase terrible things that happen. Um, it's called The Guns of His Eyes. The Guns of His Eyes. Send the boy back up the highway. Send him back across the state line. Walk him to his door. Turn his television off. Tick him back years, then tuck him in with gentle stories. Never teach him the world is his to race. That a man is a man when he lords it over, when he Daniel Boons it down any street. Teach him no mother would be proud of a son who murders. No judge would ever gavel such crimes justify. The name Kyle means a narrow channel, a tight passage between two islands. I wish I could build a boat to navigate the hate, to sail through this time and the next, to long ago and far ahead and calm the waters. I wish I knew how to load this poem with just the right ammunition, how to open every clenched hand, how to discharge a cleansing fire. As he ran, the guns of Kyle's eyes were opened wide. He seemed startled at his success and held his rifle close. He wore his power casually, backwards, like his cap. Sorry for the sad subject matter, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Coming to you from um, next door to the Shenandoah Mountains in Virginia and hoping you all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. I'm enjoying the reading very much. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, yeah. Um, the theme of clocks and what, what, what will emerge? What will emerge? Thank you. Well, next we will be hearing from Latoya Whipple. Welcome. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate today. Absolutely. Glad to have you. I bring you greetings from the state of Virginia, Danville, Virginia. And the piece that I would like to share today is entitled Time by Latoya Whipple. Time is a small word that has an enormous meaning. Time is the way one spends minutes, seconds, and hours. Time is a precious thing to waste. So spend it wisely. Time is irreplaceable. Time will go on with you or without you. There are 1,440 minutes in a day. There are 86,000 400 seconds in a day. 
there are 24 hours in a day. How does one spend time? Wastefully or usefully? Time keeps on ticking. It is not something one can stop clicking. Time is taken for granted by many people. Time will determine your fate. Time will determine your rate of success. Time spent with you is irreplaceable. Time spent with you is immaculate. Time spent with you is insurmountable. Time spent with you is impactful. Time spent with you is as sweet as three scoops of ice cream on a cone. Time with you as if it gets sweeter and sweeter the closer you get to the end of the cone. Time with you as if it gets more desirable the closer you crunch into the ingredients of the cone. Time with you as if it gets tastier, the more it settles. Time spent with you is addictive. Time spent with you is craveable. Time spent with you is like a natural high. Time spent with you sparks my soul in peace. Oh, time spent with you is immeasurable and I love immaculate, immaculate. Thank you, LaToya. Thank you for that meditation of time. Thank you. Seeing Thank you. through the cone. I could see the ripples on that. I don't know what kind of cone it was, but I felt like it was the sugar cone. I could see the ridges on that sugar cone. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. All right, we move through time to our next reader, whom we've heard from never enough times, and we get to hear one, and we get to hear one more time today. Martina McGowan. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Um, coming from um, Indianapolis, I'm trying to think about where I was. This first is uh, lost in time. You, drifting in second gear, though sometimes you move so quickly I cannot follow. Sometimes you know who you are, who I am, but not always, not today. I search my own memories for the name you call me today that is not my own. Probing the time and dimension where you currently find yourself, I try to calm your distress, our distress. Often I cannot retrieve the answers quickly, and I am sure we are somehow on the same walkabout, the same journey into oblivion. Mysteriously, the gears shift, flopping back into the present, and this makes you sad. You know you have missed a beat, lost your place in our dance. How I wish I could hold your hand and pull you forward or backward so that we could travel the same frequency more often and to weave some passage and find my way into the elasticity and Velcro that now holds your mind hostage. To mind the metrics in the flow of time for you, but maybe I do not wish to know the future so well. Perhaps the same demon stalks my path and I will know when the time is ripe 
or possibly I will not know at all, lost in time, waiting for my guide to take my hand or just waiting. This next one is um, it's called Before. It's um, an ongoing book of hours project. Before dawn, before pride and person begin to slide in, before the planet wakes, I am here alone, pure, distillate, elemental. Before time, before the application of seasons into memory of a gentler age and pace, before thoughts of space and time and death, before pining and forgetting, void between two worlds floating in a dark sea of warmth like a womb, a kinder assessment of this life begins to insinuate itself. Lovely lines come and go, unbidden, unmolested, uncollected. Before plans and planning, before planks of doing and being begin to stack themselves like cords of firewood, before pain, before light, before sound, before the birds enter this sanctuary of silence, before the vagaries of life and the vicissitudes of fate intrude, before I become so many other people, I am at peace with being only me here in this temple of utter darkness and stillness, heart petitioning that it could remain so, but the dawn, she approaches and she is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Martina. Always great to hear one or two or more of your poems. Fantastic. So glad you're here today. Well, we are moving through time beautifully and I think we're going to get to our waiting list, it looks like, doesn't it, Kim? So yeah, um, number 11 in our cavalcade of clocks today is Barry Curvin. Hi, Hi Barry. Sandy. Hi, Sandy. How are you? Uh, you hear me okay? You sound terrific. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to give you one poem and my take on the, the clocks is my uh, take is not less, not so much on time, but on clockwork and uh, the pure mechanics of clock. And the poem I'm going to read was my response to uh, the jump start I got from a song I heard by a band called Shown a Knife from Japan. And they had a song called uh, Wind Your Spring. And I just gave me a great jump start, and uh, I wanted to try and get the same feeling over in this in a spoken word piece. So it has the humble title of Prologue to Greatness. Nothing's wrong, but all's not well. You're the bunny that's not Duracell. Concrete's mud beneath your feet, and even sugar's not so sweet. Your life is a rundown clockwork thing and there's no hand to hand to wind your spring. Nothing is as you thought it would be. You're scared to death of all you see. But when you're scared to death by all you see, scared back to life is what you should be. Back to life and the lesson only living can teach. No theory class, not drama, not speech, but the practical arts where all in each will help you grow until you reach. Reach the key that winds your spring, makes your cuckoo call, makes your alarm bell ring, makes your cymbals crash on your tricycle thring. Life can play the song that makes you sing if you can reach around and wind your spring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. Oh, yeah, I love the idea of the clockwork, the clockwork. Oh, fantastic. Well, next we will hear our final feature and then we will definitely get to um, our, uh, some of our poets on the wait list. I might even get, I might even get to throw a poem in to the mix today. Uh, so next we'll hear from Isaac Cohen. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
say, uh, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, Don. Happy Hanukkah and uh, happy Christmas to all my friends in the world. I the coin, the new present. The sun is setting now for us. Tomorrow it will bring us peace. The sky will be colored with hope. No red, no black of despair. Happy and joyful circling parents and children when they will fly to feast with the clouds. Sunrise of God. And uh, now in uh, Hebrew, uh, special, Itra Cohen, Matana Hadasha. A shemesh shokat afshav avuenu. Machar itavilanu shalom. A shamain itzavu im tikva. En adom. En shoho shel yeush. שמחה וצחוק יסובבו הורים וילדים כאשר יעופו לחגוג עם העננים. זריחה של אלוהים. Thank you, Adeko and Israel. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you, all my friends in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. So I always, we always appreciate hearing as uh, yeah. Josephine said, poems in uh, folks' home languages, as well as, uh, you know, in multiple languages. So, so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah also. Yes, yes, yes. Happy to all my friends. I also. We have completed for today our featured poets, but we have plenty of time for some additional for some additional poetry. Uh, as I said, uh, we like to do the poets focus, the live open mics, and and have them go if we care to, to 90 minutes, we don't have to use up all the time. But next we have two more poets. Uh, it's in the, when we go to the, when we go to the poets off of the featured list, it's one poem, two to three minutes. And uh, as I said, we do have some space for a few, for a few more folks. If you, if you would, uh, I would welcome a few more poets if you haven't read yet and you'd like to read on this theme. Um, so next we have Harvey Sauce. Hi, Harvey. Can you hear me now? Okay, fine. I, I was just working on a poem literally as I was sitting here called National Watch and Clock Museum. Um, if I got a moment, I'll, I'll do the prior version of this one of the first things that I wrote. Uh, this one is, I, I suppose, peripherally uh, thematic in the sense that it does relate to end of days. So, uh, you know, end of time, timelessness, whichever it's called, High tea at four as the apocalypse draws near. 
whether we make it to four or one is a matter of debate. Uh, we'll sit there drinking tea, reading tea leaves, you and I. Yours will be a lapsang souchong or a complex pu'er, smelling of morning mist and not quite the end of the world. Mine will be a more gentle green with peaceful notes of sights unseen, the Taj Mahal, Kathmandu, Paris, as viewed from the observation deck of the Eiffel Tower. Or perhaps one of those four famous oolongs Wu Yi mountainsides are known for. Da Hong Pao, big red robe, Ti Luan, Iron Monk Warrior, Xu Jing Yi, Golden Water Tortoise, Bai Jing Guan, White Coxcomb, all from one of the four famous branches named by the ancients like constellations, grown high enough up to possibly survive us. Amazing how much one can fit into a teacup taken straight with a splash of milk when expectations have shrunk so. We will, I surmise, share a plate of those little tea cookies, expensive, but what the hell, what else are we going to do with our unused traveler's checks? Ours will be a corner table, ceiling, high windows, buying us a panorama of tea enthusiasts clinging to ice flows, Arctic and Antarctic, turning deep sea trenches into pitchers of unsweetened iced tea. Not having packed anything much to go, there being no point to it with oblivion knocking on the door. We will stuff our faces with cookies, unburden ourselves of secrets, play footsie under the table, our socks furred from static electricity, having left our shoes on the doormat in keeping with tea house decorum. A few boats will still rock resistance at the wharf like melting ice cubes before dragging their captains under following some code of conduct till the end. You will say you love me. I will say I love you over and over again until sun and moon not giving us the usual 30 days notice unload some of those frequent flyer light years comped through millennia of flying. Hello, goodbye to book the next available flight out of the Milky Way. Too ashamed to look on at the mess we've made they are still born and still being born sons and daughters. One small step, no giant leap. Apparently not even potty trained. Global warming having steeped the continents to a muddy brown. Auf Wiedersehen. Hoku Sai, prince of a rough sea hung on the walls, will compliment our longings too long unexpressed nicely. The hostess ever so polite will maintain the painted queer mask of a geisha, apologizing for any slight tremor in her hand as she serves us, offering complimentary spoonfuls of jasmine pearls to cleanse the palate, if not the conscience. Sharing as she bends towards us with more hot water, the last of the first blush tea leaves, some perfume neither of us can identify, with just a hint wafting out from under her kimono of the menstrual flow of catastrophe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harvey. As uh, Josephine wrote in the chat, an epic, an epic reading. Thank you. All right, mm -hmm. folks, we have, uh, I think we've completed our our uh, list for today. So I will let you know that Scott Norman Rosenthal will be reading next, and then it will be Janet McFadden. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. I just wrote this. It's not <laughs> finished, of course. I had no poem about clocks. Remembering future, past, present, illusory, inescapable. Nation, quote, nation follows nation, unquote. 
Regret leads us out of life into time. The world builds time, the edifice, the vast edifice which stands. It's not finished. And if I have, if I have a, another 30 seconds to a minute, because this is, this is my quintessential Austin, time. No. It's sort of what? bad. It's really sort of bad. Oh, hold on. My sense of self at best is notional. Hold on. Gurus. Okay. Not sure. Not sure what happened there, folks. But go ahead, Scott. Verses in Chinese style for our friends at the Poetry Festival, Autumn 1990. The store, the song we sing is history. The struggling we do is history. Look, after the bombs rain. The walls we build seem eternal, immobile. The land, the sky, will swallow them. What strange fruit blossoms in time? Mm. Someone, longhorn antelope, will run up from the sea, graze the streets of seaport towns. Hard mist is everywhere. Let us spin wheels through prairies into mountains. You and I. We struggle with demons. We wrestle with angels. Alter the trueness of their names. Lightning, time, rain. In the cities, Luciferian chanting. I experimented a little. I changed the order of the stanzas just to see how it would work. Poetry should be alive, you know, everything else is. Indeed. Thank you so much. Scott Norman Rosenthal, appreciate that meditation on time. All right, we will hear next from Janet McFadden and then after Max, Vandersteen, and we're we've just got a couple more folks to go, and uh, looking forward to our final tickings of the clock today. Thanks, Janet. So great, great to have you with us today. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Um, so this poem, um, well, it's sort of this is about time according to rocks. Um, which is a whole different framework than us little humans. And I thought, well, there's nothing to do with clocks in here. But then I realized, no, there is, because these are granites, and granites have one of their uh, minerals is quartz. And quartz is one of the things that they make very high-end clocks out of, quartz clocks, because the quartz is, have some kind of radiation that comes off of them in a very dependable way, which I cannot explain and don't really know. But anyway, this poem is called The Boulders of Lyell Canyon, which is a beautiful canyon in Yosemite named after the European father of geology, Charles Lyell. There were plenty of other cultures before the Europeans of his time that knew an awful lot about geology and an awful lot of cultures outside of Europeans who knew a lot about geology. But anyway, this is what the canyon is called. The boulders of Lyell Canyon. I name them upright, lengthwise, split down the middle. These granites strewn like milky stars. 
You could orient by them, find your way through creek, meadow, and wood. This one is here, and that one is there, its neighbor next to both, old friends grinding down shards of philosophy. It could take a million years to see the argument to conclusion. Points split finer and finer, rubbed to a sheen into pebbles, then to sand in an hourglass. They record the course of floods, huddle together beneath parent slopes where they were wrenched and scraped by glaciers, shaped and molded by teachers of ice, which explains their patience and hardness, having been milled so interminably slowly to an exacting rule. Now they languish, sun seeping into feldspars and micas, into the quartzes, until they quiver with pure excitation in heat and cold, wind and stillness, through minutes and millennia, and still radiate impassiveness. Thank you. Got to talk to those stones. Minutes and millennia, minutes through millennia. Fantastic. I'm, I'm so glad that we had got to spend some geological time with you today, Janet. Thank you. And thanks for bringing the geologic. All right, next we will hear from Max Vandersteen. Welcome. Sandy, um, kind of a nice treat to have a chance to read today. It's been a pleasure to listen to so many great poets. I didn't think we'd fit more in, but I'm really happy to have this chance to share this poem. It's called Life in a Day. I'll start with Dawn. It's a wonder when it's all in front of you, yet you know seeds will blossom all too soon. No need to combat the harvest moon, nor contest the ephemeral cycle, each day spawned by the living, giving sun, radiant beacon, beacon animating everyone, dawning young and promising the summit as impetus of life and stimulus for production, provoker of hope and source of transduction and prospect of limitless light and time, nor with limits foreseeable on the horizon to size, shape, or height of mortal vision. Morning, onward in time of the day and all deeds, revival and glory prompt to the rise as upward the orb ascends the skies to the trust and goals of hearts and souls incline and accord to raise their stature as crops and corbs appear and then mature yet determined still on the slant of the world and influence of their inherited terrain. Aspirants themselves may great altitudes attain, comparable and illusory accomplishment, paralleling the path to the acme of the sun and peaking at the noon of a day half done. Afternoon, like a solstice in time of the solar day, when acts are not, but shadows are hidden, turning back or forward motion seems forbidden and a land so alive through the drive to vertex settles slow with the sun, yet still nourishing fertile minds whose daydreams are flourishing, perhaps the daily reaping preparing, or enlightened by the rays to cherish moments of war ere the day does perish, but dipping with the diminishing arc in heat and strength and intensity to illuminate their true identity. Dusk, the circling clock nears a revolution, ere the aura of sunlight does recede, powering down drive, desire, and the need to succeed, as earthbound the spirit and declining star, while realizing only daily divination approach their ultimate destination. Fugacious day eclipsed and foreshadowed in a convergence of worlds beckoning, a controlled collisioning, collision dark in reckoning. As spectrum of day fades and shades of nova, spent, bent and blurred by the disappearing sphere, review is sequenced through a prismatic tear. Twilight, it's no wonder when it's all behind you and you know new seeds will grow tomorrow. No need to reflect in moonstruck sorrow 
or repel the sun's recurring cycle. Each new day rekindled eternally, each day's rays refracted temporarily, till again universally extinguished and obscured and failing resolution to end the heliocentric revolution in a piece of lunar enlightenment and nocturnal encouragement of the rest beyond the vivid, vibrant daily quest. Thank you. Yes. I see that time is so, so vast. Like vast in that poem, amazing, amazing. Mm, all the places we get to go today for the, this time with poetry. All right, I am going to uh, ask Don Krieger to share with us next. And then I believe I will share a last poem with you all. And then we will move on through time for the rest of our day. I'm not sure, did, maybe did Don hear me? <laughs> Don Krieger. Now I think you can hear me. Now we can hear you. Yes. So. <laughs> oh, you've, you've muted out again, just FYI. Yeah, not yet. How about now? Yep, gotcha. How interesting. Um, anyway, I got inspired to read this one by Latoya's use of the word immaculate. And uh, this is a poem that was that was published by Laurie Desrosiers in uh, Naugatuck River Review. Alternate universe. We built rocket payloads for the vacuum of space, immaculate. Our test systems were just as clean, spark welded stainless plumbing, scrubbed with solvents, blasted with dry nitrogen, then pumped down and baked red hot. I apprenticed with Jim Murphy, an old man, a widower, like I am now. He often spoke of his life in the church since her passing stained glass window repairs, broken sewer pipes, how his watch ran backwards that time he went with another woman. That's alternate universe. Thank you so much, Don. That's, that's uh, from your upcoming new book, which, uh, in the in the speaking of time, we cannot wait for. So uh, thank you for sharing. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna end with today's reading, and uh, we'll have a couple announcements at the end as well. Um, this one was recommend was uh, recommended, so uh, I'm going to honor the request. I should say a poem from Boats for Women called Manifesta. And I'd like to dedicate it to all of you for sharing your time here today on our poet's theme of clocks. This is called Manifesta. These are declarations of the most intimate kind, the ones you kiss into your pillow through the concentric night until you wake to feel the presence of the beloved arriving from the other room, even though she is three states or 11 miles away. In this moment of half lucid dream, the distance stands before you, irrelevant as desired new boots. Alone in bed, which side to exit to the floor of today 
matters less. You've made the choice to turn toward a sacred face, a turn toward your own longing to live, to meet the day head on, not so much a collision as a delicate fusion of strangers now becoming known. In this compressed space, the new feels misplaced like keys lost for weeks. Beloveds, beloveds, punch your time cards, your optimism tickets with restless tears to clock the moment you tattoo your present name to your forehead, a reminder that you'll look in the mirror with wonder each morning, see yourself and remember that the beholder is the eye of grace. Well, thank you all for gracing us today with your poems on this poet's focus on the theme of clocks. I will like to remind you of all the folks that we've heard from today. We started the hour with Laurie de Rogers, Marsha Karp, Sylvia Clare, Kate Wegrazin, Meg Carney, Lynn Shapiro, Josephine Lore, Kim Ports Parsons, Latoya Whipple, Martina McGowan, Barry Curvin, Isaac Cohen, Harvey Sauce, Scott Norman Rosenthal, Janet McFadden, Max Vandersteen, Don Krieger, and yours truly, Sandy you know, I hope I have not missed any of the names of the folks who read today. Please, please, please feel free to unmute and share your appreciation for all of our poets who read today. Max Vandersteen. <laughs> hey, great everybody. Wonderful Thank reading, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for hosting you. us. Oh my gosh, what a really, what a fantastic reading on this theme of clocks. Um, if uh, you, we try to do one on a theme, on a poet's focus once a month at least, and uh, we will be coming back with more themes in the upcoming year because we only have two more readings for this for this calendar year before we flip that page on the calendar to uh, the new year. Next, uh, so next week will be, please return, join us back and we'll be our new books showcase with, get ready, <laughs> get ready for these poets to join us. It will be, it will be. I'm getting my list, my friends. I've, I've just posted it in the oh, thank chat. You. Thank you for posting it in the chat. I had the names and I wanted to make sure I didn't mess up on them. My apologies, everybody. We will be hearing from these poets. It is, thank you, Kim, Sudeep Sen, Kathleen Flanagan, Pamela Hobart Carter, and Marsha Karp. I, I'm so excited we get to hear Marsha again so soon. Um, these, I hope you'll be able to join us for the new book showcase, our last of this year. And then on December 19th, it's our final reading of the year. It's our holiday 
poetry, open house, or as I affectionately like to call it, the ho po oh reading of the year. Um, there'll be a few special guests joining me, but mostly it will be in celebration of all of us who've gathered uh, through the year for this beautiful platform. So I welcome you to come to the open house with a poem you'd like to share in community and in the spirit of peace and giving and of the holidays. So you all will be the features. Again, a few special guests will be joining me. That will be Sunday on the 19th of December. Well, thank you once again, everyone, for being here today. Thanks to those of you here in Zoom, those of you who are watching from Facebook, hello, hello, hello. And of course, those of you who will be hearing us in, in memoriam, uh, in memorial time through the recordings, thanks to Don Krieger. Again, we'll see you next week. And as I always like to share at the end of our readings and our time together, our, you know, our, our well-being really depends. Our well-being and humanity depends on our deep listening of one another. And today has just been another fine example of that. I thank again each of you for joining me in that practice on this Sunday. For some, it's Monday. And until next time, I'm Sandy Yanone for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Be well, take care of your beloveds, and of course, keep writing. Be well, my friends. <laughs>